I was a, a regular customer. And one day I just, you know, told them, if you need help, I would love to join their team. And they had the spot open. It was just a wonderful opportunity. It was perfect. Hello, readers. I'm Victoria Wood, and you're listening to Biblio Happy Hour, the show that shares new book releases, we chat to the authors who write them, and the people who sell them. Every week, we'll share some of the new books that will be hitting bookshelves that week. We'll invite an author or two or more on the show to talk about their debut or newest release, and we'll introduce you to an independent bookseller and their bookstore so you can stop by get tailored book recommendations, and pick up some new books when you're in town. So make space on your bookshelves, follow us on social media, and make sure you're subscribed to Biblio Happy Hour wherever you listen to your favourite shows. Readers, Biblio Lifestyle is a newsletter, community, and space for people who can't live a life without books in it. Every Friday, you'll get a special treat in your inbox filled with inspirational content, book recommendations, self-care tips, original interviews, and things we think you'll enjoy. The best part? You'll only receive one email per week, and it will be an amazing five-minute read or less. So if you're not on the list, sign up now for our free weekly delivery at bibliolifestyle.com. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. This week, I'll be chatting with Shannon Stevens. She's the event manager at the Mitten Word Bookshop, located in Marshall, Michigan. We'll be talking about the bookstore, the town of Marshall, what readers can expect when visiting the bookstore, and how Shannon got involved in bookselling. Shannon, thank you so much for coming on the show, and welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we're so excited to have you here. So really quick, before we get started with the show, are you a coffee or a tea person? Ooh, that's difficult. Um, I'll go with coffee. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. So uh, yeah, let's get into the details about the bookstore. Tell us about the Mitten Word, where you're located, and share a bit about your town. So the Mittenwood Bookstore is located in like the heart of downtown Marshall on the main drag with lots of other wonderful shops and restaurants. It's a beautiful downtown area and everyone has a lot of pride for their downtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, They do a lot of work around here to do events and bring people down. We get a lot of tourists. It's, It's a really wonderful place to be. We have the American Museum of Magic right up the street. Uh, Marshall has the largest um, National Historic Landmark District. Really cool. They do a a house and garden tour every year that is pretty big. Wow, wow. So tell us about the bookstore. Uh, When did the bookstore first open? And what can readers expect walking in? Give us a visual from the front door walking in. What can we expect? Okay, so we... Um, We're generally a young bookstore. We opened in April of 2018, Um, so we're constantly improving. But when you walk in, it's actually really cute. It's kind of a a narrow building. actually isn't a building. It used to be an alleyway, but there's this beautiful, like, tin design ceiling on top with lots of uh, light. And you just go down. We have two rows. We have rows of books on either side. Uh, One side's our fiction. Uh, the other side's nonfiction. We go into the back and we have this large children's section, middle readers, young adults, graphic novels. Uh, in fact, we dedicated the children's book corner to Anne LaPietra, who ran a bookstore called The Kids Place uh, back in the day. And she was just a um, kind of a, a cornerstone of the community at, at that time. So uh, Jim and Jenny Donahue, the owners, wanted to honor that. And so they dedicated the bookstore. The, the children's book corner to her. Oh, wow. So uh, tell us more about you, Shannon. How did you get involved in the bookstore business? Uh, was this something you knew you always wanted to do or did just an opportunity present itself and you're like, hey, yeah, I want to work at the local bookstore? Well, it's, it's a funny story. It actually started in Battle Creek, Michigan, which is about 20 minutes away. They had opened up a store before the Mitten Word called Battle Creek Books. And I was, I had just, I'd gone downtown and with my mom to go to the bank and I just suddenly saw they were opening up a bookstore. And I was literally looking through the, the windows, watching them 
uh, my future employers, <laughs> um, watching them uh, put the, the shelves up and, and get the store ready. For two years after that, I was a, um, a regular customer. And one day I just, you know, told them, you know, if you if you need help and, and need someone that, you know, has some experience with event planning and, and whatnot, that I would love to join their team. And they had the spot open. It was just a wonderful opportunity. It was perfect. And I've loved working for them with them and helping them grow this new location ever since. It sounds great and sounds like a match made in heaven. Uh, what would you say so far is your biggest challenge working in an independent bookstore, but also what is the thing you love the most? Well, obviously for love the most is, um, is easy to say because you're surrounded by people who love books and you have to talk to people about books every day. You know, whether you're finding something for someone else or they're just telling you what they really like and, uh, and learning more about that and adding to your personal reading list. It's a great atmosphere having people come into a bookstore because they're just so excited to see a, a physical bookstore in their in, in downtown area. I think people are, are really coming to appreciate that again, having the, the, the small independent bookstore physical location of it rather than yes. online sales. That being the challenge is always, you know, online sales of books and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, it can be really difficult for a small um, store with a limited selection to provide us for some larger businesses. Uh, wrapping up, what would you like everyone listening to know about you and the bookstore? What do you want everyone listening to know about the Mitten Word Bookshop in Marshall, Michigan? Uh, well, the, the Midward Bookshop is locally owned, the staff are local, uh, the owners, Jim and Jenny Donahue, have worked really hard to promote and support literacy in the area and helping people get their hands on affordable books to enjoy and uh, learn with. Absolutely, absolutely. Shannon, thank you so much for taking the time out and coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was great. Readers, you can connect with the Mitten Word Bookshop in Marshall, Michigan at their website, themittenword.com. You can also find them on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The Mitten Word. If you'd like to tune in to the rest of my conversation with Shannon Stevens, the full podcast episode will be available on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. To find an independent bookstore near you or when you're traveling, visit bibliofinder.com. Bibliofinder is a new online directory for independent bookstores and they help users to find bookstores worldwide based on your current or planned location. If you're on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram, please tag Bibliofinder in your indie bookstore photos. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and our inability to visit our favorite bookstores, please use Bibliofinder to find bookstores online and support them from home. You can shop directly from their website, store affiliated pages, or you can simply call in your order. Before I get started with this week's new releases, I'd like to highlight two literary birthdays happening this week as well. On March 25th, novelist and short story writer Flannery O'Connor was born on this day in 1925. She's famous for her southern gothic tales which are widely anthologized and studied as classic works of American fiction. Popular works include A Good Man Is Hard To Find, Wise Blood, The Violent Bear It Away and Everything That Rises Must Converge. On March 26, the poet Robert Frost was born on this day in 1874. Five popular poems written by Frost include The Road Not Taken, Stopping by Woods on a Snowy Evening, Fire and Ice, Acquainted with the Night, and Nothing Gold Can Stay. Now, I will be mentioning some of the books that will be available on bookshelves during the week of Monday, March 23rd. And I'm thrilled to have authors Marina Kemp, Rachel Harrison, Megan Giddings, and the writing duo Christina Loren on the show to talk about their new books. 
New this week from Ballantine Books, The Herd by Andrea Bartz. When an exclusive New York woman's workspace is rocked by the mysterious disappearance of its founder, two sisters must uncover the haunting truth before they lose their friendships, their careers, and maybe even their lives. New from Delray Books, The Last Human by Zach Jordan. The last human in the universe is on the run from a godlike intelligence in a rip-roaring debut space opera. New from Knopf Books, The Glass Hotel by Emily St. John Mandel. The Glass Hotel is set at the intersection of two events, a massive Ponzi scheme collapse and the mysterious disappearance of a woman from a ship at sea. New this week from Viking Books is a debut novel entitled Marguerite. And we have the author Marina Kemp here with us to share all the details. Marina, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Thank you so much for having me. So your newest novel, Marguerite, will be available on bookshelves this week in the US. How excited are you? How are you feeling? I am so excited. It's really scary and really exciting and very surreal. Um, it feels like such a long time since since the publishers came on board with the book. And because, you know, the process is such a long one, I've kind of been waiting for this time for so long. And now I have actually not been through this myself because my daughter's not old enough. But I imagine it's a little bit how I will feel sending her to school for the first time. Because suddenly I can't have any influence over who uh, interacts with the book. At the same time, I, that is a wonderful because I suppose in the life of the book, the writing is its first phase. And then I think of the second phase very much as the part where I step out of the picture completely. And it's really up to readers to um, build a relationship with the book and interact with it as they want. So, yeah, it's that that is very scary, but also incredibly exciting. Right, right. Absolutely. So tell listeners about your new novel, Marguerite, and what can readers expect? So the novel is set in France. A young woman called Marguerite comes from Paris to a very small, very claustrophobic village in southern France called Saint-Sulpice. And she comes to um, work as a live-in nurse for an old man called Jerome, who was once a very powerful character in the village and is now old and and dying, um, living on his kind of rambling, secluded estate. Marguerite is, I would say, pretty damaged when she arrives in San Sulpice. She's running from a very painful past that she's kind of trying, she's tried to bury, um, but she's she's quite consumed by, by guilt. And as she's there working for Jerome, I she sort of starts to come to life a little bit, partly, I think, in response to Jerome's hectoring and bullying, but also because she encounters a local farmer called Henri, who in a very different way is also kind of living in hiding and suffering himself. When their lives come together, there is this chance for connection and acceptance and compassion and perhaps some calm. But those things are called into jeopardy, not just by the villagers who are watching um, and highly suspicious and kind of looking for that great, uh, next great drama to unfold, but also by themselves, by this kind of web of secrecy and shame in which they've each enmeshed themselves. I suppose what readers can expect, um, a very French setting and a lot of kind of secrecy and lies and watching and gossip, but also... I think at, at, at its heart, this book for me is about, it's an examination of what it means to live and to really live fully and be alive and choose to step into the light. Right, right. Okay. So what inspired you to write Marguerite? Tell us about some of the wheels that were turning in your mind at the time. What's your inspiration? I wrote a short story when I was about 17 or 18 about this uh, young woman in the middle of nowhere nursing a very foul like bullying old man and um I lost the story because I th- it was on some laptop that kind of became defunct at some point but 10 years later 10 or 11 years later I found myself just still coming back to that story often in my head just to that central relationship between the young woman and the old man so I started trying to write it again as a short story and as I started writing I realized pretty quickly that it was coming out as something a lot bigger in scope um, and with a lot of other characters that I hadn't envisaged the first time around. So it ended up turning into a novel. I kind of went went with it and the story made itself clear to me as I was going along, really. Okay. So outside of Marguerite, who's the title character, uh, who's your favourite character in the novel? 
I think the character that I was most attached to and I remain most attached to is Henri. He's very different from me. His life is very different from mine. But I think the kind of struggle that he's living with, which I would say is to to live with not with nobility and integrity and kind of honor, but bit, he he keeps being pulled back from doing that by his own shame and um, kind of self loathing. I think that is something that so many people struggle with. So I I found that a lot of the things he does are you know reprehensible in many ways. I found him probably the most intriguing and sense and sympathetic character. Right. Right. Okay. So getting into your process a bit now, how long did it take uh, to write Marguerite, start to finish? It was three years, start to finish. I think I, I'm not very good at writing small amounts regularly. So there would be vast tracts of time within those three years where I didn't write a word um, if I was uh, sidelined by work and other other commitments. So it was very much a case of when I could find the time, I would just dedicate a whole week to it and get lost in it. So I don't know how much of those three years I was actually writing, but yeah, start right. to finish, three years. Right, right. Okay. So if you didn't write, what would you do for work or as a creative pursuit? Um, so for work, I do still, whilst I'm not, when I'm not writing, I work with other writers. I used to work in publishing. So what I do now is and work as kind of editor and mentor, I suppose, for other writers, trying to kind of advise them on the publishing process and edit their work and I love doing that that is quite a nice kind of counterpoint to writing my own stuff reading other people's um in terms of creative pursuit I really don't know I think when I was younger I did a lot of creative things I loved contemporary dance I I danced a lot and I loved illustration and ceramics but I definitely wouldn't be doing those things now unfortunately if I wasn't writing because I just wasn't good enough at those things even if I would love to have been able to continue them Okay. So getting into your reading life, what was the last book that you finished reading that you would now recommend? I recently read, I was on a plane and I read Mary Gateskill's um, This Is Pleasure, which is a tiny little book. And I just thought it was brilliant. It's so powerful. It's like a little bullet of a book. It was such a refreshing take as well on on kind of Me Too issues. Uh, Mary Gateskill captures this friendship between a woman and her long-standing friend who she adores, but who has behaved pretty badly and and is now being accused of sexual harassment. And I think she's just, Gate School's so brilliant at kind of letting you warm to the characters and getting really close to them whilst also seeing how deeply fallible they are. And, you know, you, I left the book feeling really uncomfortable, not not really knowing where, where my allegiance lay, which I think is often the sign of really brilliant writing. Right, right, absolutely. So part of the podcast is all about indie bookstores and indie book sellings. So share with our listeners some of your favourite indie bookstores. I live in London, so I'd say my favourite would have to be the London Review Bookshop. It's in Bloomsbury and it's beautiful and it's in a gorgeous location and everyone there knows kind of staggering amount about books. So if you ever want recommendations, it's a really wonderful place to go. Um, There's also a bookshop called John Sando in um, Chelsea, which I, I don't go to as often as I'd like because I live on the other side of London from it. But it's wonderfully chaotic, tiny, kind of tumbling little place with books just everywhere. And again, booksellers who just know everything there is to know about books. So it's a pleasure to go there and talk to them. Right, right. Absolutely. But uh, getting back to Marguerite now, how do you want readers to feel after reading this book? What are some of the reactions you're hoping for? I think in this novel, there is a lot of suffering and um, pain within most of the lives of the characters within it. But there's also, I hope, a lot of joy and life. And I, I think if there was one thing that I would love readers to take away from it, it would be that even in the context of great pain, there is chance for us to live properly and to kind of not sign ourselves off to the shadows, um, but to find joy and find love where we can. Right, right, absolutely. Marina, thank you so much for coming on the show. Readers, Marguerite will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March 24th. Thank you so much. Readers, you can connect with author Marina Kemp on Twitter at Marina Kemp Paul. 
You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Marina in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. She shares more about her writing process, her work schedule, what she's not doing when she's reading or writing, and projects she's currently working on. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New this week from Viking Books, Grown Up Pose by Sonia Lally. Grown Up Pose is a modern look at what happens for a young woman when tradition, dating and independence collide. New this week from Berkeley Books is a debut gothic and horror novel entitled The Return and we have the author Rachel Harrison here with us to share all the details. Rachel, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be on. Oh, absolutely. We're super excited to have you. So your debut, The Return, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you feeling? How excited are you? I would describe it more as like an intense, debilitating anxiety. I'm very <laughs> nervous. It's my first book. Yes. Um, and there's not really a way to like prepare or kind of wrap your mind around the fact that this thing that's been kind of in your brain for so long is now mm-hmm. just out in the world. Yeah, it's a real thing, and I'm sure it will hit you even harder when you actually see it in the real world on bookshelves everywhere. Oh gosh, probably. <laughs> That'll be a surreal feeling, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us about your novel, uh, tell us about The Return, and what can readers expect? Um, so The Return is about a group of four friends in their late 20s who reunite for a weekend at like a kitschy remote inn after having not all been together for a long time. And they're sort of trying to do the dance of like figuring out the shifting group dynamics, which is exceptionally difficult because one of the friends, Julie, has just returned from a mysterious two-year disappearance. So as the weekend goes on and tension escalates, creepy things start to happen in the hotel. And there's this looming question of what happened to Julie, where was she, and kind of what's going on. And so, yeah, that's all I'll give away, and you'll have to read the book to figure out what happened. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, but tell us, Rachel, uh, what inspired you to write The Return? What was the spark that lit that fire? So I write very early in the morning, so the birth of the idea is a bit hazy, <laughs> like pre-coffee I write. But I think really it came from my own experiences of my relationships with my close friends. Um, mm throughout my 20s. My friendships are very like complicated and beautiful and nuanced and I wanted to explore these relationships through my writing. And I think horror, the genre is fun and ups the stakes, but I also find it's a powerful medium to like express real pain and fear. And I've had two close friendships um, kind of fall apart. And there's definitely a parallel between the horror in the book and the horror of having like a friend just drift apart and change and transform. And, you know, it's scary when you have somebody who you have loved dearly for years and then one day you look at them and you're like, oh, you're not who I thought you were or you've changed. And like, can we still keep this relationship going or is it at the point of no return? Right, right. Absolutely. So I'm going to put you on the spot a bit and ask, who's your favorite character in the novel? Ooh, it's hard because there's four main characters and I love them all very much. They're all my babies <laughs> <laughs> and um, bring me such joy. But I think like the more, every time I read the book and like was rereading it throughout edits, like a character would surprise me. And I think the more space I have from the book, I think the more I'm team Julie, if I'm honest, she's, she's a bit of trouble, but I think like the more I'm like distance I get from the book, the more I kind of, I'm like, she raises some good points. <laughs> she, may, she may have some question marks hanging over her head, but she may, she raises some valid issues. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. But getting into the process of writing the return, how long did it take uh, start to finish to pull this whole story together? So this is a bit of like a freakish occurrence. I started writing it in February of 2018. And I like, I think I, I just knew it was meant to be like, it was very like, it's like, oh, yeah, like, this is, this is it. This is happening. (laughs) It's going really well. And so I like really, I really hustled. And I finished the book end of September of that year Mm -hmm. so it was quick like this book happened very fast for me it was just kind of a freak occurrence and yeah so I don't want any other writers to be like what (laughs) (laughs) 
it was definitely a freak occurrence and I, I don't know hopefully lightning will strike twice but I don't know if I'll have as much <laughs> luck where it'll be like oh, a few months here it is a book <laughs> right so. Mm, okay so full-time job aside if you didn't write what would you do for work or as a creative pursuit um hmm. as far as what I would do for work maybe teach Mm -hmm. um which I guess can be creative but like growing up I always did theater which is crazy to me now because I'm like very like I have really bad stage fright and anxiety <laughs> so I don't know how like you know 10 year old me would just get up on stage but um if I didn't have writing as a creative pursuit I don't know maybe I'd go back to that and join community theater game and see how that worked out for me <laughs> <laughs> okay that sounds real interesting and good uh but nosing into your reading life now what was the last book that you finished reading that you would now recommend? Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss. I loved it and highly recommend it. Okay. And when you're not reading or writing or working, by extension, <laughs> what are you doing? I very much like to walk. I like to get as much walking in a day as I can to like listen to podcasts or listen to music or kind of like be alone with my thoughts. And I also like, I find exercise is really good for me just because I have a lot of pent up nervous energy and I like, like I can let things get to me. Mm -hmm. So having that outlet of being able to exercise during the day is really, really helpful for me, like any kind of physical activity or being outside. Um, so that's where you can find me somewhere wandering in around Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So part of the podcast show is about indie bookstores and indie booksellers. So share with our listeners some of your favorite indie bookstores. So books are magic in Brooklyn is, is magic. Um, <laughs> it's on Smith street in Brooklyn. And yeah, I absolutely love that bookstore. I think it's a really special place. And then there's the green light bookstore in Brooklyn as well, which I also love. So, I mean, there's no shortage of um, bookstores in, in Brooklyn, but I think those would be my two, my go-tos. Right, right. Absolutely. So getting back to the return now, how do you want readers to feel after reading this book? What are, what are the reactions you're hoping for? Well, I would like them to be scared <laughs> because it is a horror book. So I definitely want some people leaving the lights on. And I, I want people to be able to relate to it, to feel like, oh yeah, like this is something that I experienced in my friendships or relationships and being confused in my 20s and feeling kind of lost. I think we live in a time with social media where everybody presents a facade to the world where it looks like everybody's life is perfect, but we're all just trying to figure it out. And I think I struggled with that, especially in my early 20s being like, I like I, I don't know what I'm doing, but everybody else seems to know what they're doing. So I, I try to weave that into the book and I hope people who read it can relate to it and simultaneously be terrified by it. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Rachel, thank you so much for coming on the show, everyone. The return will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March twenty fourth. Thank you for having me. Readers, you can connect with author Rachel Harrison at her website, rachel-harrison.com. You can also find her on Instagram at Rachel Harrison's Ghost and on Twitter at Rach Face Logic. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Rachel in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. We talk more about her writing process, her work schedule, and her favorite childhood book. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New this week from Grand Central Publishing, Save Yourself, a memoir in essays by Cameron Esposito. Save Yourself is full of funny and insightful recollections about everything from coming out. New this week from Hatchet Books, Lady in Waiting, My Extraordinary Life in the Shadow of the Crown by Anne Glen Connor. New this week from Little Brown and Company, Enter the Aardvark by Jessica Anthony. New in paperback from Back Bay Books, If She Wakes by Michael Corita. New from Orbit Books, The City We Became by N.K. Jemison. In the city we became, five New Yorkers must come together in order to defend their city from an ancient evil. New this week from Amistad Books is a debut novel entitled Lakewood. 
and we have the author Megan Giddings here with us to share all the details. Megan, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. So your debut novel, Lakewood, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you feeling? How excited are you? I am very excited and also very nervous because it's something I've wanted for a very, very long time. But it's also kind of so thrilling to think of people actually getting to read and think about my book. Uh, So tell our listeners about Lakewood and what can readers expect? So Lakewood is about a young Black woman. Her name is Lena. And at the start of the book, she finds out, and it's not really a spoiler because if you open it up on page one, you find out her grandmother died. And she finds out that their family is in an extreme amount of debt. Her mom has a medical condition as well. And Lena realizes that she needs to drop out of college to be able to support her family. But she also realizes that a college dropout and that happens to be a young black woman in Michigan, it's going to be really hard to find a job that will give her enough money to take care of her family under those circumstances. Okay. So what inspired you to write Lakewood? Uh, Give us some behind the scenes details on this. Well, I think two things inspired me. One was I had a family member who, thankfully, he was misdiagnosed, but for a while, we were under the impression that he was going to be very sick. And while we had moderately good insurance at the time, we were not going to be able to afford a lot of things. Right. And so I I think it's something a lot of people can relate to, which is terrifying, but true. And then I've always been been really fascinated by research studies, especially the bad ones that kind of get dramatized a lot in the media, like Mm -hmm. MKUltra, that kind of have just fueled a lot of people's imagination. Yep, yep, absolutely. So I'm going to put you on the spot a bit now and ask, who is your favorite character in the novel and why? I know it's really easy to say that the protagonist of my novel, Lena, is my favorite character, but she is. I've spent so much time with her and thinking about her. And I think I really relate to the idea of a young woman who just wants to be a good person and wants to help other people, but can really get herself into trouble in the process of trying to be good. Okay. Uh, Getting into your process, how long did it take to write Lakewood? I started Lakewood in 2014. You know, I still should count the revisions I did with my editor, Patrick. Mm -hmm. So about four years of Lakewood, and it's been really hard to leave that place, even though it's a very strange and terrifying one. Right. Okay. And if you didn't write, what would you do for work or as a creative pursuit? For work, sometimes I think I would be an incredible manager of a movie theater. I, I know it's not a glamorous thing to think, but I really like working with people. I love movies and storytelling and also I get a lot of satisfaction of sweeping things up so I think I find it very weirdly fulfilling to clean popcorn out of the theater at times. <laughs> okay <laughs> but on that note I'm going to lead into my next question which is when you're not reading and writing what are you doing and I'm going to go on a limb and assume that you watch movies. I watch movies I've gotten really into running lately I have three cats who I spend a lot of time playing with because one is very young and always wants attention. Um, What else do I do? Oh, I cook. I like cooking and gardening. (laughs) Okay. So getting into your reading life, what was the last book that you read that you would highly recommend? The last book that I read that I'd highly recommend, it's Days of Distraction by Alexandra Chang. And it is so funny and so moving and... There's no one else who writes like Alexandra. I think people are going to love it. Awesome. Well, what would you say is your favorite childhood book? Oh, that's a deep question. It says so much about me. Um, I think thinking as like a child child, the books I remember the most reading and getting a lot of pleasure out of with Frog and Toad are friends. And there's this scene where they eat ice cream together on the porch. And I remember just looking at it over and over again because I wanted the chocolate ice cream they were eating. And I was really <laughs> fixated on it. Okay. What about in young adulthood? Uh, what's a book that stands out for you? I think the YA book I remember learning the most about and that made me really want to write 
was Judy Bloom's Tiger Eyes. It was the first book I remember reading and thinking that I could not tell my parents that I was reading this book. And it also just made me like realize how exciting life could be. I still, every time I pick up a book, I hope that I can have that feeling where anything is possible in that book. Right. And that's how I felt when I was reading Tiger Eyes. Oh, wow. Awesome. So um, part of the podcast is about indie bookstores and indie booksellers. So share with us some of your favorite indie bookstores. Favorite of all time is Literati in Ann Arbor. Every time I go to Michigan to visit my parents, even though Ann Arbor is no longer exactly on the way, I have to stop in Literati. Some of it is a lot of my reading and writing life really started in Ann Arbor. I went to University of Michigan, and Literati wasn't there at that time. Back then, it was Shaman Drum, which I really miss. I loved going to Shaman Drum and just walking around and looking at all the poetry selections. Oh, that was such a good bookstore. Mm, okay. Um, getting back to Lakewood, though, how do you want readers to feel after reading this book? What What are you hoping for? I think it's really hard to anticipate how anyone's going to feel after experiencing. Well, hopefully when you read Lakewood, you'll consider it art. But I do feel like it is art and it is something that's going to bring up a lot of feelings for the right reader. I guess I would like a reader to think about what we're asked to do now to be there for each other. How how can we support each other and how, how do we work to be good people? when it feels like the odds are steadily stacked against you if you don't have access to money or privilege or connections, how can you still be moral in the way that most people want to be? Yep, yep, absolutely. Again, thank you so much for coming on the show, everyone. Lakewood will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March 24th. Thank you for having me. Readers, you can connect with author Megan Giddings at her website, megangiddings.com. You can also find her on Twitter at M.E. Giddings. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Megan in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. She shares more about her writing process and other projects she's currently working on. So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New this week from Harper Books, The Everlasting by Katie Simpson Smith. The Everlasting is a historical fiction novel that's set in Rome in four different centuries. It explores love in all its various incarnations and ponders elemental questions of good and evil, obedience and free will that connect four unforgettable characters. Near this week from Harper Perennial, The Faceless Old Woman Who Secretly Lives in Your Home by Joseph Fink and Jeffrey Craner. New in paperback from Harper Books, The American Agent by Jacqueline Winspear. New from Harper Via, Then the Fish Swallowed Him by Amir Ahmadi Arian. Then the Fish That Swallowed Him is a powerful and harrowing psychological portrait of modern Iran that exposes the oppressive and corrosive power of the state to bend individual lives. New from William Morrow Paperbacks, If I Never Met You by Marie McFarlane. New this week from Gallery Books is a new rom-com entitled The Honey Don't List. And we have the writing duo Christina Loren here with us to share all the details. Christina Loren, welcome to Biblio Happy Hour. Hi. Hello. Thanks for having us. This is Lauren, by the way, <laughs> and I'm Christina. Okay, so ladies, your new novel, The Honey Don't List, will be available on bookshelves this week. How are you ladies feeling, Christina? Um, I'm super excited for it to come out. We had a lot of fun writing this book. Lo came out to Utah because we live in different states. Lo is in California and I'm in Utah. And she came out here for a few days and we outlined it and, you know, did some research and stuff. And it was really fun. So I'm really excited for readers to get it. What about you, Lauren? How are you feeling? I'm excited. I'm always nervous. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny. This is our 25th book. So it's sort of a milestone for us. And it's been a really amazing journey 
but it's I think there's this assumption that because we've done this before it gets easier and it it, it is always stressful every time <laughs> every time <laughs> So uh, tell us about your novel, The Honey Don't List, and what can readers expect? So The Honey Don't List is kind of in the same vein as The Unhoneymooners. So if readers were looking for one of those, um, the funnier side of Christina Lauren, you're going to get that with this book. It's a story about two assistants. They work for home uh, remodeling gurus that have a, you know, HGTV show and they have a whole line of furniture and, and they're a married couple who have built their brand on the successful happy marriage. And the secret is that they are no longer happily married, but because that is such a huge part of their brand, it's really important for them to maintain that facade. And so when they go on a book tour to promote their book about successful marriages, our hero and heroine, James and Carrie, the assistants are asked to go on the book tour with them to keep, you know, the wheels on the proverbial bus. So it's basically a story about how these two assistants who are basically doing all of the work and dealing with very difficult personalities find comfort and support in each other. And in the process, they also fall in love. Oh, okay, awesome. So what inspired you ladies to write The Honey Don't List? Uh, tell us about some of the wheels that were turning in both your minds. Um. So I remember we were having a conversation and I can't, Bo might have to correct me what it was, but we had the idea, but I believe they were, they weren't TV hosts. I don't remember what they were in the, like in the, oh, they were movie stars in an early version. Right. And we were talking to our agent one day and she said, you know, it'd be really great is if they were like a do it yourself or like empire king and queens, obviously like a la Chip and Joanna King. And as soon as she said that, we it just like the wheels started turning. We hadn't started outlining at that point or anything. The wheels just started turning because like when you watch those shows, it's just about like how adorable they are. Yeah. You know, they're seeing their faces at Target or whatever on magazine, you know, covers. And what if all of that was just a huge like facade? And so like I said, Lo came out and she hadn't ever watched like Fixer Up or any of those shows before. Mm -hmm. So it was really fun to like watch those with her and kind of get <laughs> ideas and stuff. And then it was really funny because I can't remember if we had just finished it or we were still writing, but I was in the grocery store one day and there was like a magazine that had like chip games on it and it was like the mistakes I've made or, you know, and we're like, oh no, oh no. We're like, no. <laughs> Because we've written books before where like we'll say something in a book and then like later it like happens. So we were like, oh no, no, please don't, no. So, <laughs> so you know, we write a book like we write a book like a year before it comes out, a year plus before it comes out. So right. but it, that's not what it was. It was just like a clickbaity magazine title. So Okay. Yeah. Well Awesome. So I'm going to ask both you ladies this question. I'm going to kick it off with Lauren. Who's your favorite character in the novel? Well, so in this character, in this book, um, we each wrote a character. So Christina wrote Carrie and I wrote James. And of okay. course, we both edit everything. So we, we end up writing both, both characters. But in the drafting phase, I wrote James and I love him. I really relate to him. The character Carrie in this book has a movement disorder called dystonia, which is the same movement disorder that my father had and that my sister has. And so it's really personal to me. So mm. I think the way that James feels tender toward Carrie in this book is sort of the way that I feel tender toward my sister, at least it's about her, her symptoms and just making sure that she's not stressed and that sort of thing. So that was, I think, writing from that point of view was really nice for me. Um, and also, he's just kind of a nerd, and I love him. He's like a sexy nerd. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. Okay. What about you, Christina? Um, I love, I loved Carrie. And like, one of the things we always say when we're like coming up with our characters, is you have to find all the kind of little like quirks and stuff about them that make them feel like real people. And so one of Carrie's things is that she grew up in Wyoming, like kind of on a farm. And so she has all these weird little sayings. And so I, I grew up in Utah. And so I'm sort of in not the country, but you know, I'm not in like Salt Lake City. Right. And so I remember one day, I think Lo and I were together or something. And I, I could smell weed, like somebody was smoking weed or something. And I was like, it smells like somebody's burning ditches. <laughs> and like, Lo was laughing so hard because she was like, what are you even talking about? So like, Carrie has all these little things that she says, you know, that are 
they're not hillbilly things, but they're they're kind of you know like mm-hmm. James has to like double take and like try and figure out what she's saying. Like she loves Dolly Parton, she you know wears her Dolly Parton T-shirt, and she says all these things that her dad does. She grew up on a farm and talks about chickens, and you know, so those sorts of things were really fun to do. Right. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So I know both you ladies get this question all the time. But I'm going to ask anyway, for the benefit of our listeners who probably haven't caught you through other media, but how how does this two-person writing one novel thing work? You know, when we first started, Christina would write one character and I would write another, and then we would edit as we went and then edit once the book was all complete. And it, it worked really well that way because we usually had one project at the time that we were working on. But very quickly, I would say within the first couple books, we just had too many things going on. And so we always get together to outline and we always draft and we always edit, but who writes who and what order and all that stuff, it just depends on what else we have going on. So, you know, if one of us has to do major revisions on a book that we've already finished and we have to be drafting one, then we sort of divide and conquer. But it's, it, it, it's been different for every single book. And it's funny because Christina came out here last week to outline our 2021 release. And we were at one point, you know, we were doing it really well and we were having a really good time and we felt like this is the best system ever. And we're like, how is it that we don't actually have a system for outlining books? <laughs> like we change it every single time. And, you know, that that will be our you know 27th book and we're like still figuring it out. So, right, um, right. you know, life changes and we change in the way that we want to do it changes so we just have learned to be really flexible right what yeah. about you christina what are your thoughts i mean it's it's really funny because something about this book always makes me laugh because the fact that like melissa and rusty people don't know that they don't like each other we've had people say to us you guys really like each other and i remember one time we were standing in line somewhere and somebody we overheard somebody saying like oh they don't really like each other they just pretend and when i was at lowe's like we always laugh at that when i was at lowe's this week outlining there, there was just this moment, I think, where we looked at each other. We were having so much fun outlining, and and like it just like it, like cemented this thing that we're so lucky we get to do this together. And even though like every process is different, every book mm-hmm. is different, mm-hmm. we still get to do it with our best friend, and we still get to tour with our best friend and share the like ups and the downs and everything. And it was just so funny that this book we were writing was like our twenty eighth or something Mm -hmm. that we were outlining yeah and yet it was just like this completely different process and like she said we were looking at each other like what are we doing at one point we were doing (laughs) post-it notes and and then I was like Lo has this big wall of windows and I was like I wonder if we could write on the windows with dry erase marker and then we were like what if we put paper behind the windows and we were like what about wrapping paper and you know you would think that we would like have this solid plan and know exactly what we were doing (laughs) we were like we were looking at each other like, okay, you start. <laughs> no, you start. <laughs> you start. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter how many times we've done this. Right. It just, it's like new every single time. It's almost like, you know, having all these kids and, you know, no, no child is the same as the other. Right, right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if you didn't write, what would you do for work or as a creative pursuit? What would you do, Lauren? Well, so before I left my job, I left my job at the end of December or the end of 2013 in December. And before that, I had been a scientist. I worked um, for a pharmaceutical company working um, at developing treatments for um, macular degeneration and uh, different eye diseases, retinal diseases. So I probably would still be a scientist if I hadn't left my job to start writing. But I've always written. I've written since I was probably... 10 or 11, I was, would write stories in journals. So I think the creative side would always be there, but there's an element of creativity in science too, um, coming up with, you know, interesting ways to ask a question. Right, right. What about you, Christina? Before I left work, um, I, I always worked with kids. I worked in a junior high school in the counseling center, and I loved it so much that if uh, tomorrow I was not writing anymore, I would go back immediately to that. That was an adjustment to make was not seeing those kids every day. And I remember I considered like volunteering at one point, but it's not the same because you have those same relationships if you don't Mm. see them every day. And I didn't start writing until I was 32 and I'm 43 now. So I've been doing it for a few years, but I, I don't know what I would do creatively because I didn't write before. And now I, and now it's hard for me to imagine a life where I didn't, where I wasn't watching movies and 
picking apart how they did it and what I would have done differently. And, you know, so I don't actually know what I would be doing. Mm. Okay, so getting into your reading life, what was the last book that you finished reading that you'd now recommend? Lauren? I just finished Boyfriend Material by Alexa Tall, and that's out July 7th, and it is amazing. Seriously, I laughed out loud so many times. It was, <laughs> like, exactly the book I wanted. And I'm just starting, which is um, just out recently, is The Lord I Left by Scarlett Peckham. Oh, okay. What about you, Christina? What was the last book that you read that you now recommend? So I read, just a little bit ago, um, Someone We Know by Sherry Lapina, and um low has it sitting at home and so uh, when i was there i was like you should read this you should read this you should read this because i want to know what you think you, should, you know and um i just loved it so much and i think i talked about it way too much and i also um went through this big like leanne moriarty thing where i read like all her books mm-hmm. um and so i love those and right now i am reading bitter falls by rachel kane i read that entire series last summer and i was so excited tuesday when i realized that one was out Hmm, okay. All right. So part of the podcast is all about indie bookstores and indie booksellers. So share with us, ladies, some of your favorite indie bookstores. Christina? Well, I mean, of course, there's the Ripped Bodice in LA. That store is amazing. If you are ever in LA, like on a vacation, you should totally go there. For, we're in California. One of my favorite things is when we get to see the Mysterious Galaxy people. So I love those. Okay. Mm-hmm. What about you, Lauren? So we, of course, love the Bodice. Um, Joyce Galaxy is amazing. We've also had a really great event at Pattern Cover in Denver, which is oh my such, gosh, yes. a, such a great store. <laughs> awesome. um, and also the Strand in New York. I really love that place. I wish they had a romance section, but they have really great selection and they have kind of that, you know, when you first walk in, they just have all of those fun things for book lovers too, like socks and stuff so it's good for gifts for everybody like you can go buy your books there you can buy gifts there it's just a really cool store oh awesome we were really lucky last tour we got to go to a bunch of um indie stores and i'm so amazed at all of the like romance focused events oh my god like these stores have yes yeah in cincinnati that store is amazing i loved it and then we got to do one more page in um yeah they like really really cultivate these like mm-hmm. this feeling of community and so people are always super excited for the book when authors come they're super excited for the authors to come and they just really show up and it was really neat to see right yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely so getting back to the honey don't list how do you ladies want readers to feel after reading this book uh what are some of the reactions you're hoping for uh lauren i hope that people read it and just have a fun book experience. I mean, that's our, our whole goal is really just to give people a little bit, little bit of an escape, whether you're on vacation or it's the weekend or it's your nightly read. Um, we just want it to be fun. And I think this one is lighthearted. It's playful. It has sort of a different format because we have these fun little like police interviews that break up the chapters. And so I just, we just really want people to be entertained and to think Carrie and James are just the cutest because we love them. Right. Absolutely. What about you, Christina? Um, I think that one thing that might, I mean, obviously, yes, if, if somebody tells us like they got to escape from the world for a few hours, then we 100% feel like we've done our job. But I think on this one, they might walk away having a little bit more respect for the people who make their lives easier. You know, a lot of times the people behind the scenes are the ones that are making everything happen, but they're not the ones that get the spotlight. So I think maybe that will come out of it a little bit. Okay, awesome. Christina, Lauren, thank you so much for coming on the show. Listeners, The Honey Don't List will be available in bookstores on Tuesday, March 24th. Thank you. Thank you. Readers, you can connect with Christina and Lauren at their website, ChristinaLorenBooks.com. You can also find them on Facebook at Christina Loren Books and on Twitter and Instagram at Christina Loren. You can also tune in to the rest of my chat with Christina and Lauren in our off-the-cuff discussion over on our Patreon page. They share more of how publishing their first books changed their writing process, what they're doing when they're not reading or writing, and new projects they're currently working on. 
So head on over to patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder and tune in to the rest of our conversation. New from Simon & Schuster, House of Glass, The Story and Secrets of a 20th Century Jewish Family by Hadley Freeman. New from Atria Books, The Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle by Rob Kenner. New this week from Simon Pulse, Between Burning Worlds by Jessica Brody and Joanne Rendell. Readers, if you need a more tailored selection of books to keep on your radar, or you want to hear more from your favourite authors that we've had on the show, become a patron at patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. For a dollar per month, you'll get our monthly top shelf recommendations of new releases that we're super excited about. You'll also hear more from your favorite authors in our off-the-cuff discussions. You'll get our full Meet the Bookseller podcast episodes, get bookish-themed Instagram templates, plus lots more. That's patreon.com forward slash bibliofinder. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. New from FSG Books, Like Flies from Afar, by Kay Ferrari, translated by Adrian Nathan West. New from Minotaur Books, The Last Taurus, by Olin Steinhauer. This is book four in the Milo Weaver series. Also new from Minotaur Books, Running Out of Road, by Daniel Friedman. This is book three in the Buck Shats series. New from Tor Books, a Broken Queen by Sarah Kozloff. This is book three in the Nine Realms series. Also new from Tor Books, A Labyrinth of Science and Sorcery by Curtis Cradock. This is book two in the Risen Kingdom series. Also new from Tor Books, The Poet King by Ilana C. Meyer. This is book three in the Harp and Ring sequence. Readers, I hope you enjoyed today's show. A list of all the books mentioned in the show will be available over at bibliohappyhour.com. To shop all the books I've mentioned in the show and to find a bookstore near you or when you're traveling, visit bibliofinder.com. If you're on Twitter or Facebook, please let us know at bibliohappyhour and tag us in your post over on Instagram, also at bibliohappyhour. If you enjoy listening to our podcast, please share Biblio Happy Hour with your favorite bookish friends, share us on social media, and please leave us a rating and review. Don't forget, Biblio Lifestyle newsletter subscribers are the first to know all the podcast happenings, get free goodies in the mail, and they can enter for a chance to win some free books. So if you're not on the list, sign up now for our free weekly delivery at bibliolifestyle.com. I've included a link in the show notes so you can sign up there. Alrighty readers, that's it for today's show. Thank you so much for listening and happy reading.